God bless you. God bless you. I hope you'll let us know how we can be praying for you. Today, we are continuing our revisit of a series that I did in 2020 about my favorite verse in the Bible, John 3.16. This message centers around the importance of the incarnation. You know, when the Word became flesh and God swapped eternity for calendars. Scripture says that the number of God's years is unsearchable, Job 36.26. We may search out the moment the first wave slapped on a shore. We may search out the moment the first star burst in the sky, but we will never find the first moment when God was God, for there is no moment when God was not God. He has never not been, for he is eternal. God is not bound by time. But when Jesus came to the earth, all this changed. He heard for the very first time a phrase never used in heaven, your time is up. As a child, he had to leave the temple because his time was up. As a man, he had to leave Nazareth because his time was up. And as a savior, he had to die because his time was up. For 33 years, the stallion of heaven lived in the corral of time, One moment he was a boundless spirit, the next he was flesh and bones. He who was boundless became bound, imprisoned in flesh, restricted by weary prone muscles and droopy eyelids. His once limitless reach would be limited to the stretch of his arms on the cross. The one who wore the crown of heaven traded it. He traded it in for a crown of thorns. Why? Let me tell you, friend, he did it just for you. I hope this revisited message is an encouragement to your day and a strength to your soul. All the best. Whatever you're going through, wherever you are, may God give you strength. May God give you strength. This scripture, John 3, 16, has everything we need to give us hope in these difficult days. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish, but he shall have or she shall have eternal life. Boy, what a scripture. And this phrase right in the middle of it, that's where I am right now. One and only Son. Oh, I just knocked a letter off when I lifted it up. Oh, well. It is an essential statement, an essential claim about Christ. I want to talk about it. It'll take me seven minutes, but I believe it's seven minutes worth your time. Either way, whether you stay around or not, let us know how to pray for you. Let us know how to talk to God on your behalf because it is to God that we need to turn. Now, the wildest doctrine in the Christian hope is this one called incarnation, the incarnation of Christ. And the idea is simply this. The Jesus of history was the God of heaven. The incarnation refers to this dual nature of Christ, at once and equally God and man. Now this is all over the New Testament. The Apostle Paul contends that God was born in human likeness, Philippians 2.7. Peter, the Apostle, confessed Jesus as the Son of the living God. The great confession. Thomas in the upper room, once delivered from doubt, he declared, my Lord and my God. Again, the Apostle Paul applauded Jesus as the God blessed forever. He urged Titus uh, to anticipate the blessed hope and the appearing of the glory of the great God and our Savior, Jesus Christ. Titus 2 and verse 13. And to the Colossians, he summarized in him, speaking of Christ, all the fullness of the deity dwells in bodily form. Colossians 2 and verse 9. The Hebrew writer was all over this too. He went so far as to call Jesus Christ the Nazarene carpenter. Here's what he said. The radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his nature. Hebrews 1 and verse 3. So this idea of the incarnation was not a casual, not an occasional, but it was an essential, an essential conviction of the first century followers of Christ. It was was the horse 
which pulled the wagon of faith. No one ever attempted to dilute it. No one attempted to downplay it. No one apologized for it. No one dulled the claim of it. They believed, and Christians today believe, that Jesus was completely God, completely man. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. Not became in the sense that He stopped being God. No, no, no. While in fleshly form, He maintained His divine power, His divine essence. This is an astounding thought, and it's one that proves to be a, a stumbling block for many people. Yes, he became a one-celled embryo. Yes, he became a kid skipping rocks as a young boy uh, in Nazareth or, or sanding wood in his father's carpenter shop. Yes, he became a man of flesh and bones. Yes, he had toenails and hunger pains. Yes, he became flesh, but he never stopped being God. Never. He still ran the events of history still commanded the kings. He was still in charge of running the universe, everything, every galaxy, every government. He ran the world. Who he was before he came to earth, he still was while he was on the earth. Now this mystery, this mystery has been too great for some to swallow or, or, or embrace. If they take this lion-sized doctrine of the Incarnation and they try to trim the claws, they try to dull the teeth, you're not going to have to look very long before you meet some philosopher or even a religious person who believes that Jesus was all man with godly attributes, that He was the greatest of all saints, that He was a guru, that He was a spiritual master, He was a liberator, He was... He was a divine sort of person, call him godly, call him godlike, call him God inspired, call him almost God, but don't call him God. Now, he was different from most, but not unique above all. You hear this a lot today. Tolerance is the, religious, is the religion of our time. Many thought leaders, they don't bash Jesus, they just don't embrace Jesus as Scripture portrays him as God-man. He was quasi-divine, but not quite divine. And if you believe that Jesus was a good man on earth, but not God on earth, friend, you don't stand alone. A lot of people believe that. But you do stand on shaky ground. You stand on shaky ground. And you got a problem, I mean it, a problem so blatant, so clear, that... Sometimes I wonder how anyone can call Jesus just a good man. A, a good man would not say what he said. A good man would not claim what he claimed. You know who would? A liar would. A fraud would. You either got to call him God or you got to call him crazy. But call him anything in between. And you got a dilemma. You got a dilemma. How could a good man make claims that Jesus made. No one, no one on earth believed that Jesus was equal with God more than Jesus did. When at his own trial, his accusers asked him, are you the son of God then? You know what he said to them? He said, yes, I am. <laughs> Could it be any clearer? Luke 22 and verse 70, his purpose in his words was to give his life as a ransom for many. Matthew 20 and verse 28, Jesus believed himself to be the Son of God. Could he be more clear than John 14 and verse 9? He said, he who has seen me has seen the Father. You've seen me, you've seen the Father. And then when he said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. John 14 and verse 6. Friend, make no mistake. Jesus saw himself as God. He leaves us with two options. Accept him as God or reject him as a fraud. There's no third option. There's no middle ground. He is either God or godless. 
heaven sent or hell born, all hope or all hype, but nothing in between. You remember this famous paragraph I'm reading from C.S. Lewis. A man who was merely a man and said the sort of things Jesus said would not be a great moral teacher. He would either be a lunatic on the devil with a man who says he is a poached egg, or else he would be the devil of hell. You can shut him up for a fool. You can spit at him and kill him as a demon, or you can fall at his feet and call him Lord and God. But, but let us not come with any patronizing nonsense about his being a great human teacher. He's not left that option open to us. And never did he intend to. Why would we want to? Why would we want to minimize the beauty of the incarnation? Why would we want to reduce it? Why would we ever want to remove any of the beauty of the power of the presence of God on earth. Don't we need this astonishing stoop of grace? Don't we need a God who is human enough to understand us and divine enough to save us? Friend, let all of Jesus enter. Welcome the humanity of Christ. It's so human that he can understand where you are today. Welcome the divinity of Christ, so divine that He can help you today. But don't attempt to tame this lion-sized Savior. He won't be tamed. And indeed, you don't need Him to be tamed. <laughs> Let Jesus be for you what He is, human enough to live next door, and yet great enough to be your Savior. That's who you need today, my friend, in these unprecedented times. Unprecedented times. You need Jesus Christ. I'm wondering if these may be the days in which he's issuing his final invitation. I really am. I don't know, but I'm wondering. And if they are, would you please say yes to the one who has said yes to you?